Well, good morning, Green Valley. Who's excited to be in church today? I'm so glad to see you guys, whether you're in service or online. I was thinking about the favorite donut thing. My wife, Barbara, loves donuts, and her favorite donut is typically any donut. That's how she would respond. So hope you're having a great morning so far. Hey, as Scott said, we're in this We're in this series called Uncontainable, where we're going through the book of Acts, and we're looking at the early church and how the early church was uncontainable in terms of spreading the gospel into the world. But not only uncontainable of spreading the gospel as as Jesus sort of uh, commanded and mandated us to do to spread it to all ends of the world, but, but also to spread it through generation after generation. And it started with the early church. And if you think about that, this is how significant this is, is that we get to come here today. We get to worship and praise God today because of the origins of the early church. It's a pretty amazing thing that we can stand here today because the early church was uncontainable in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ into the world. You know, a couple of days ago, I was reading a story that was in the news that it happened back in August of 2023, and it was on the west coast of France. There was a man, Hubert Eru, a Frenchman, who was walking along the beach, and he came across a bottle on the beach that looked a little bit unusual in terms of the bottle. So he stopped because it caught his eye, and he went over to this bottle, and when he picked it up, he found that this bottle had a note in it. And so he opened it up, and it was still in good shape. The wax was on the top of the cork. He opens up, and he reads this note. And it was a note written from a 10-year-old boy in Sandwich, Massachusetts. And the note basically read and said, my name is so-and-so, and I'm doing a science project. We're doing a science project in our fifth grade class, and we're studying the ocean currents. And so we launched this bottle, and if you find this note... Please notify us in the school and gave the address to let us know where it ended up. So who got this note, but the amazing thing about this note was that it was written 27 years before that. That he picked this note and this kid who is now 37 years old sent this note. And so Hubert sent this message back to the school saying, we found this. And you think about this kid, 37 years old, who sent this when he was 10 years old. And all of a sudden, this note shows up 27 years later. I was thinking about that story because it made the news, as I said. But it's kind of similar to the gospel message when you think about it. You see, the gospel so often can start with the most unlikely small places, and it can reach people that are very, very far away. And when I say far away, not just geographically, but it can actually reach people who are far away from God. And it can go against the currents of culture. It can go against the storms of life, the ups and downs of life. And it can even reach people that maybe we've thought about in life that said the gospel can never reach that person. Or you've given up on somebody that says they will never come around to the gospel message. I was thinking about that in my own life because I went through 10 years of my life where I was living away from God's message of grace and the gospel, kind of living on my own. And I know there was people in my life during that time that had given up on me in terms of the good news message. But here's the good news is the gospel message never gives up on us. Isn't that good news? And once that bottle is unleashed, once the message is unleashed and uncorked, it is life-giving and it is life-changing. So today what I want to talk about for a few moments is I want to talk about the uniqueness of the gospel message, of the power of the gospel comes a lot through the uniqueness of the message. And so we're going to be in Acts chapter 15 today, if you're interested. It's actually a big chapter. It's a critical time in the early church. So I'd say this. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I would really encourage you to take some time during this week and read the chapter because there's so many aspects of it. But one of the keys in there is that we learn about the uniqueness of the gospel and also the power of how it proliferates into the world. 
So we'll be going through that. I'm going to kind of paraphrase it, and then I'm going to look at some key scriptures through this that, that kind of pull out this point about the uniqueness of the gospel. But as we start out today, I just want to ask you a question, and that is, have you ever, have you ever got a product, bought something that you wanted to use that you found was a little overcomplicated to use? You ever bought something that was like hard to use? This is a true product right here. I looked it up. This is the world's <laughs> largest Swiss Army knife. Well, I was right. So true, it weighs two and a half pounds. It has 187 functions and 87 different implements on it. I mean, it has everything from a fish scaler to a compass, a cigar cutter, an arc welder, and a toaster that are all built into that. <laughs> it's, it's so funny because, again, there's a real thing that people jumped on this whole idea on Amazon reviews and just started doing all these reviews, just sort of underscoring the complexity of this thing. So one person wrote in there, this is an amazing tool, gave it five stars. I, only, I not only did my nails, but repaired a small engine at the same time when I was done. <laughs> the best, though, was the second person gave it one star and said this, it took me an hour and a half to find the spoon and my cereal got soggy. <laughs> you know, the fact of the matter is we do have a tendency to overcomplicate things in our life, including when it comes to our faith. It's easy for us to overcomplicate the message of the gospel. And the problem is, is when we overcomplicate that message is when we actually miss the message of the gospel. And so we're going to look at that in this story today. And I just want to start out with this one thought, and that is this, is that the gospel is unique in its simplicity. The gospel is unique in its simplicity. And don't get me wrong, the, the gospel is profound, it's multifaceted, it has some deep, deep theology in it, but at the same time, it is profoundly, simply beautiful at the same time. And I think it's easy for us to complicate that message. And so I wanna give you just as a standard here, I wanna read you what John Piper wrote about the gospel message. We'll just go ahead and put it on the side screens actually, because I think it's just starting out just to have sort of a context. But this is, what, this is one version of it that I think is pretty simple just so we are on the same page. He says, the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for our sins and rose again, eternally triumphant over his enemies, including death, so that there is now no condemnation for those who believe, but only everlasting joy through eternal life. So with that thought, this is the early message of the church that said that Jesus called us to go out and bring the good news into the world. And this was what was happening in the early church. Paul, the apostle Paul, had established a church outside of Jerusalem in, in Antioch, which was sort of the beachhead for the Gentiles to reach them. So it's now modern day Syria. And so he's preaching to the, to the Gentiles, the non-Jews at that time, because Peter had had this dream that God showed him that this message of the gospels for everyone. So this is all going on at this time, and this is where we pick it up in Acts 15 just to set the tone. So Paul's preaching this good news to the Gentiles, and this is what happened. Verse 1 and 2. It says, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some of the other believers to go up to Jerusalem, see the apostles and elders about this question. So what's happening here is, as I said, Paul had established these churches, but there were some Christians, Jews, that became Christians that started to say that, yeah, salvation comes through Jesus Christ. In addition to, you have to be circumcised and become Jewish. You have to follow the laws of Moses. So there was these two things going on. Some Jews actually believed Christianity wasn't its own faith. It was the last step of, of a Jewish faith. So they believed that, hey, you got to do not just grace from Jesus, grace coming from the good news of Christ, but you also have to do these things to become Jewish. 
And so this became a really critical moment in the early church because what was happening is the potential for the church to actually split where you had Jews, Christian Jews, and you had non-Christian Jews or Christian non-Jews, Gentiles. And so the critical moment here, because God's plan is the gospel encompasses everyone, one spiritual family, it says this has to be addressed. So it says in that text that Paul and Barnabas went up to Jerusalem to discuss this with the church in Jerusalem. And this is what became known as the, as the Jerusalem Council, one of the most critical times. And so James, Jesus' half-brother, was leading the church in Jerusalem. The apostles were there. Peter was there. Paul and Barnabas come up and state their case about this message does not have additions to it. It's God's grace saved by faith, the good news. And the Pharisees who were there who believed differently said, you know, no, it's this. And so the council takes it under consideration because Peter stands up during this council and just gives another gospel message of what it's all about, including that this message is for everyone. So the council takes it respectfully under debate, and they come back with the answer that Peter's right, that God has called this message through faith and Jesus Christ only is the one that they support. And so they sent a letter to these Gentiles who are waiting to hear because they're getting conflicting information. They're hearing that, that, that God's grace through faith in Christ is, is, is what it requires. Others are saying, no, it's this and this. So they bring a letter back encouraging the Gentiles that says it is faith through Jesus, and here's how to live that out, that gospel message. So it averts this critical time where the church could have actually split, and so with that, I think it's important for us to take something out of that story because the same thing can happen right now if the gospel gets diluted, if it's overcomplicated. And there's one thing I just want to say that helps us to continue to further the gospel in our world today that has the same implications as then. And here's the one thought, and that is simply that the gospel is simply the work of God's grace, not ours. The gospel message is simply the work of God's grace. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a place uh, most probably have where you ha- to attend something that you have to have a certain dress code. I don't know if you've ever, maybe guys, uh, you know, maybe you don't own a jacket. I have one, I own one jacket, but you go to a restaurant when they tell you, oh, you need a jacket or, or a tie or whatever, and they go get one out of the closet, you know, because that you don't have one yourself. I don't go to too many restaurants that require a jacket, by the way. Chipotle doesn't require you to wear a jacket there. <laughs> You have to wear a shirt, but they're not going to ask you to put a tie on or anything like that. But some people go, and you go, hey, to eat at this table, you have to wear these certain things. I mean, some people go to private schools. In private schools, I grew up, I went to a private school for a while where there was a uniform you had to wear. To attend this, to be part of this, you have to wear a uniform. For others, it's a... There's sporting events, believe it or not, that require certain dress attire to attend sporting events. I mean, if you're going to go to a Raider game, I mean, you're required to, to wear these things at Raider game. And if you're wondering, yes, that is Scott and Kelly right there at the last game that they went to. (laughs) Somebody actually booed at the last service, by the way. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. There's jobs that have requirements of a certain dress attire, right? I worked in a a field in the semiconductor industry for many years. I was in human resources, and I worked on the manufacturing side. And in the manufacturing side, the, the place where semiconductors are manufactured are in a what is known as a class one clean room, which is 1,000 times cleaner than a hospital operating room because the technologies and the science behind uh, nanotechnology and submicron technology is you can't have any particles contaminate those. So the employees that work there have to wear these suits. They're called bunny suits. And so they have to put these on and their job. So every time they're in that fab, and think about it, they're spending like 10 hours a day there, they have to be wearing these to be operating in this clean room environment. And the amazing thing is, is that if they come out of that clean room to take breaks or they're going to have lunch or whatever, they come out, they take some of that off, but to go back in, they have to take what is known as a particle shower, which is this, this process where it takes all those contaminants off you before you go back into that clean room. It's an arduous process. And we had to hire like a 1,000 people 
to, to operate one of these fabs. And so part of the interview process was to watch people put these suits on because number one is they have to do it in a fairly timely manner because you're doing it on and off all day long. And then secondly, that you're okay with working the number of hours in a bunny suit like that. And I say all of this because I think when it comes to God's grace, to approaching God, a lot of people start to convolute the gospel with dress requirements to come to God. That you have to be a certain way or you have to, you have to look a certain way or act a certain way or, or be clean and have your stuff together in a certain way before you could ever enter into a relationship with God. And that's what's happening with these Pharisees who who had accepted Christ as the Messiah and were in a relationship, but then they started adding all this stuff like, here's the additional dress requirements to have a relationship with God. Look at verse five, because it it, it sort of comes back in the council itself. You know, Paul and, and, and Barnabas come up to the council and they start telling people that all these Gentiles are coming to Christ. And it says in the text in verse four, it actually says that the council was overjoyed that all these people came to Christ. And in the middle of this celebration, then this happens. It says, then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, uh, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. You talk about a buzzkill, right? You're celebrating, some raise their hand, uh, hey, by the way, it's great that they came to Christ, but they also have to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses. I mean, there's no greater buzzkill than getting circumcised as a male, right? I mean, that's a, that's a total buzzkill right there. But it's amazing because these, these Pharisees were using bad math. They were using bad math and they were using the Jesus plus equation that says, hey, it's Jesus plus keep the law and don't make mistakes and look a certain way. And the problem is that math does not work because the gospel of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with our work. It's all of God's work. I don't know what it is because it's not just the Pharisees. I think, I think it's easy to focus on the Pharisees, but I, I think it's human nature. I don't know why it is that we have a tendency to overcomplicate God's grace. It's interesting to me, and I'm right there with it at times. It's like, why is it that we as humans have at times the tendency to overcomplicate the gospel message? I think personally, it's probably two things that cause that. Um, The first one is I think this concept of free is a hard one to grasp. The Bible says that the gospel of grace is a free gift from God, but we have this hard time grasping the concept of free. I had a grandfather that I was around when I was young that used to say, there's nothing in life that's free. You ever hear that? Maybe you've said that before. Maybe you believe that. There is nothing in life that's free. You've got to earn it, right? And so even when it comes to this idea of the gospel of being a free gift, you go, huh, I'm not, I'm not really believing that that's truly free. Because in this life, for the most part, most things have strings attached to it. I mean, think about it. what we advertise as free. Buy one, get one free. That's not really free because you actually have to buy something to get something free, Right? How many of you like free shipping from Amazon? That's kind of cool, right? But it's not really free because the thing that's getting shipped, you have to buy to get free shipping. So this concept of free in our life is not truly free. So when we hear this idea that says grace is a free gift from God, we start to go into this place. Okay, yeah, but what's the catch? And so what we start to do is we start to put the things around it to earn that free gift. Okay, if I do these things, then it's truly free. And so we start the bad math of adding to the gospel. I think free is a big one, but I think the other one that is even more difficult for us to deal with in terms of convoluting the gospel is the idea of control. I think control is the other one because we as humans have a tendency to want to be in control of our life. How many of you here would be willing to admit uh, that, you, or you, I'll say it this way, not to be so direct. How many of you know somebody that's controlling or maybe a control freak? 
Okay, so if you lifted the arm of the person next to you, you're probably the one that's controlling. <laughs> you can't lift the arm of the person next to you. That, does, that doesn't count. You know, control and having some semblance of control is sort of how we're hardwired. So this idea that says that, that this grace from God, it comes from God and God only, it's not my work, it's God's work, also means that I'm completely dependent on another person. I'm dependent on God because I can't do this myself. And that's a pretty vulnerable place to be in. Because in our lives, number one, is we are human and we're hardwired for sort of self-sufficiency. It's celebrated in our life. We, we are called to sort of make something of ourselves. So we do all these things in our life. And I get that. But it's easy then to go, I'm in control of things. I'm not relying on somebody else. Our culture promotes self-determination. Hey, it's out there for you. Just go get it. It's up to you. Make your life what it is. It's all on you. For others, for others, this idea of control, it's hard because maybe you were dependent on somebody in your life and you, you, you depended on them and the, and the bottom fell out and they let you down. Maybe it was a, a parent or maybe it was a, a relationship, a spouse or whatever it is. So this idea is fearful when it comes to, I am, I'm, I'm admitting that, yeah, not only is this a free gift, but I'm 100% dependent on it. And so again, we start to do the bad math in our life. Okay, God, I want this grace. God, I love you and I believe in you, but yet, God, it's you, God, and it's you plus me being a good person. Yeah, God, it's, it's, it's you plus me managing my sin. Yeah, it's you, God, and me in serving, because you'll accept me if I do that. Yeah, God, if, if I'm, if I, you know, church, great church attendance or whatever that is, that's great, God. It's, it's you and free grace. Plus, if I do these things, then, then I still keep some semblance of control in my life, which the reality is we really don't have control in our lives. And whether it's pride, whether it's insecurity, whether it's distrust or whatever those things, it's hard to truly go, God, I am fully dependent on you. Because to accept this free grace and gift from the gospel message is also saying, I need it, God. I'm dependent on you. You know, I lived my life for the longest time sort of in this, this mode where I was, I was sort of wanting to stay in control of my life. And sometimes when you've been, you know, God had me in the right place at the right time in different parts of my life where I was able to live out um, you know, a, a successful life in the sense of a good job, a good career, made good money, had lots of things, and all that was fine. But the problem with my life was is I thought I was the one doing it all and I was in control of it. And so this was all me. It wasn't really God. And so I had this arm's length relationship with God, but I'm just really on this treadmill to say, God, it's you plus me doing all these things. And God, I, 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 you know, you, you must, you know, you, you must be doing these things for me because I'm a good person and I'm doing these things. So therefore, the, the reward of that is a good life, which isn't the case at all. And the more I lived that, the more control I wanted to have in my life and the more control I had in my life, the more mistakes I made until finally the bottom fell out of my life. And when the bottom fell out of my life and in this place of a destroyed marriage and being alone and having this emptiness, there was one thing that came out of it that I did not expect that was the most important thing in my life. And I realized on that day that the bottom fell out that I can come to God just how I am, even in my mistakes. And God's not going to turn me away. See, sometimes the bottom has to fall out of our lives in order for us to realize that we just kind of, all we have to do is come to God as we are, that we don't have to have our stuff together. We don't have to try to control those things. When I was working at the fab, the manufacturing facility, that place where these guys are, these people are having to wear those, those uniforms, those bunny suits, there was a guy that was working the graveyard shift because it was 24 hours and he had snuck out. He had found a way to get up into the ceiling above the, man, the, the clean room there. 
and he figured out a way. He had this little blow-up mattress, and he was going up there and taking naps and hanging out during his breaks for longer periods of time, and nobody knew it. And so he would go up there, and he would fall asleep and take a nap literally right over the fab. And one day, the way we found out he was doing this is one night, apparently, he fell asleep a little longer and rolled off the mattress and then came crashing through the floor into the manufacturing facility. Mattress and all, right down. Ruined thousands of dollars worth of product because he contaminated it all. And so I remember meeting with him and sitting down with the fab manager, and the fab manager started the conversation because I was still a little green at that time. The fab manager goes, well, I got some good news. And the guy goes, oh, I'm not getting fired? And the manager goes, oh, no, you're getting fired. (laughs) He goes, but we're not going to make you pay back all the damage you did, the tens of thousands of dollars. We're just going to let that go. See, When the bottom falls out of our lives, when we make mistakes, when we don't have it all together, and we sometimes even crash into God because this is just who we are, God doesn't punish us and he doesn't push us away. That's the good news, that he's always there for us. He just wants us, and this is the simplicity of the gospel message, is he just wants us to come as we are. It's that God's desire is to have us to be 100% dependent on him, not partially dependent. Because when we're in that place and we understand that dependency on God, what we're gonna find out is God is faithful, God is trustworthy, God is committed, God is loving, and God will never turn his back on us. It's that simple. So the question here is just simply this. Are you living out the simplicity of the gospel in your life or are you living a different version of it? Some distorted version of it, some convoluted version of it. I just wanna leave you with four words that I think help us to live out the simplicity of the gospel. Just four words that can help us do that. The first word I wanna encourage you by is remove. And what I mean by that is to remove anything that you're adding to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the free gift. Maybe you're doing some Jesus addition. Peter said it when he stood up and talked to the Jerusalem council. He says, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have ever been able to bear? What he's saying is, why are you putting all this additional on this when this is a free gift for you? So the question on this one is, is are you living it out? Have you added something to the good news message that's overcomplicating it, that's putting the burden on you or the work on you when in truly it's 100% the work of God? This is why in Green Valley, this is a vision of ours because there's a lot of competing voices out there, even religious voices that wanna pull us away from the purity and simplicity of the gospel message. And we wanna protect it that says, it starts with the simplicity that it's the work of God and God's grace, not us. And we wanna help people to embrace that so they can experience the freedom of this free gift. Second word, first is remove. The second one is to respect. And this is simply respect others through the inclusiveness of the gospel. You know, Peter also got up as he's sharing, sort of getting people centered back to the gospel. He says this, he says, brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Then he goes on and says, God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving, them the, whole, the, giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them. I'll read that again. He did not discriminate between us and them, he, for he purified their hearts by what? By faith, not, not by jumping through hoops. See, the gospel is simply for everyone. You know one of the best ways for us, a litmus test for us to to examine how we embrace the gospel in our own lives? It's how we see other people. It's how we look at other people. It's how we judge other people. If we are putting burdens on ourselves that we have to earn the gospel, the good news of Jesus comes from our works, then we're gonna measure other, other people by what they're doing and not doing. That's how important it is to protect the simplicity of the gospel. Third word is this, is just respond, and it's to respond to the freedom that comes from living out the gospel. Simply as that. 
You know, James, as I said, he wrote a letter encouraging these Gentiles to say, it is by faith, but then he encouraged them to live that faith out. He says, instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols and from sexual immorality. Simply put, one of the greatest paths to freedom is living out the freedom of obedience that comes as a response of the gospel. Let, let me be clear about something. It is not a prerequisite for the good news. It's a response to it. And if you look at life, like we could easily look at idols in our life and say, you know, anything that we've put, brought to godlike status in our life becomes an idol. And there's, there's, there's obvious ones that are destructive in our life, habits that could be destructive, addictions that are uh, destructive that keep us from freedom. But there's even things that are good things in life that if we make them God things can actually imprison us in life. It could be a career. It could be a relationship that we put so much pressure on that we're almost stuck in that. And it's not freeing. It's imprisoning. Obviously, sexual morality, immorality is put in there because it's a huge addiction issue and it can lead to this imprisonment. And God says, freedom comes from obedience, not disobedience but it's all a response to the living out the gospel, not a prerequisite. And then the last word is rejoice. It's to rejoice in the simplicity of the gospel in your own life. It says in here that they, that were sent off, that they sent a letter to the, the Gentiles to let them know that, hey, it's faith. And it says the men were sent off and they went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter and the people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. See, what the Gentiles were realizing there is they understood their need for the gospel and they understood the life-changing gift that they got and they were rejoicing in it. I think for a lot of us who have been Christ followers for a long time, who've had a faith for a long time, it's easy for us to take that for granted. We talk a lot about, hey, things going from here to here in our lives. That it really is centered and piercing our heart, not just intellectually, but knowing it emotionally at the heart level. But I think it's easy for the reverse to happen. If we've been a believer for a long time, that it's easy for that gospel message that we accepted and embraced to start to go from here and start to come back up to here where it just becomes a theological thought. Yeah, we know it's good. Yeah, it's great. It happened a long time ago, but I'm not really living in gospel gratitude out of my life. Gypsy Smith was a, a, a 19th century preacher who lived until his late 80s, and shortly before he died, somebody asked him, how did you stay so on fire for God through all of these years? And he said, the way I did is I thought about the gospel message, and I never lost the wonder of it all. So here's my question. Have you lost the wonder of it all if you're a believer? Have you relegated it to an idea, but it's not really resonated in terms of gratitude in your heart? We talk about preaching the gospel, the good news message, and reaching people all the time here. But you know, the first person I think we have to preach the gospel to in our lives is to ourselves. You know, we talked about gratitude in life, that if you, if you write your gratitudes down every day, it makes you more thankful and it changes who you are. I started writing down and going through the gospel message and preaching it to myself on a regular basis. And you know what? It's a difference. Because I start to change my gospel gratitude and the wonder of it all starts to come back and I start to live differently because if I don't do that, what happens is I start to take things for granted. I start to add things to the gospel. I start to miss those opportunities to extend grace to other people and I start living away from God's plan for my life, which is true freedom. And so to be able to come back and just to get the wonder of it all again, the simplicity of this is a God who loved me so much, that loves you so much, that it was his work that gives us that freedom. All we have to do is accept it. I want to end with us just taking a moment here, and I'd like you to just close your eyes for a minute before I pray. And I just want you to think about something here. If you're a, if you're a person who is a Christ follower, I want, I want you to just let this resonate for a minute. I want you to think about the first time when you accepted the good news of Jesus Christ in your life. I, I wonder if you could go back and think about that moment 
and you heard that gospel and it penetrated your heart. I want you to think about that. How that felt. Your experience. Now I want you to think about for a few moments at this point, those things that maybe have crept into your life that have caused you to lose that moment. Maybe it was last week. Maybe it was 20 years ago. Maybe it was 50 years ago. But where you are now, what has crept into your life has something that has caused you to lose that moment, that feeling, that rejoicing. Maybe it's a tough life. Maybe it's difficulties that have come in life. Maybe you have some doubts. Maybe you've experienced some hardships to where you're doubting. God, do you really love me? Maybe you're basing the result of God's work on how good of a person you are and you just are in this spiritual treadmill trying to earn yourself every day wondering if you've done enough. Or maybe you're just trying to control things and there's parts of your life that you haven't completely surrendered over to God. I think one of the starting points, if that's you today, is to come back to the wonder of it all, to rejoice in the work that God has done for us, that all we have to do is receive it. Father God, I just thank you for each and every person here today. And God, I, I thank you for the gift of your good news, God, the work that you did through your son, Jesus Christ, not the work we did or have to do to earn it, but the work you did for us. God, I know there's a lot of different stories in this room right now. I know, I know there's a lot of striving. I know there's a lot of people trying to find their way or maybe to validate themselves looking for their identity, God. And I just ask this, that you impress upon us tangibly that we don't have to do that. But we can experience the true rest, the rest under the work that's resting in our identity in you from the work you did for us. I do thank you for your faithfulness. Speak to each of us very personally where we're at right now. And we ask this all in Jesus' name and everyone says, amen. God bless you.